Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, December 15th Regional Transportation Committee meeting. Uh, I will call to order the meeting here at uh, 8.33. Uh, the next item uh, is public comment. Um, I guess I will, uh, uh, Mr. Papstor for Mr. Schwenk, is, is there anybody online with their hands raised? I will look as well, who is looking uh, to make public comment at this time. Mr. Chair, I don't see anyone with a hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Uh, with nobody um, for public comment, we will close public comment 833. Uh, the next item is the November 17th RTC meeting summary. Um, please uh, feel free to review. If there are any questions or comments or changes, uh, please feel free to raise your hand um, and I will call on you. If there is anybody, please raise your virtual hand right now or press star six on the phone. Mr. Chair, I do not see anyone with their hand raised. Uh, with that, uh, I will. we will accept uh, the, the, the meeting summary. Uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, from Mr. Chair, I think we lost you. I, I apologize, Mr. Chair. I inadvertently muted you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe I'm back. Um, okay. So from a Dr. Cog perspective, uh, we, we recently went through a nomination and election process. Uh, Dr. Cog members uh, are retaining her seat. Uh, Director Wynne Shaw from, uh, from Lone Tree. We also have a new member. Uh, Director Joan Peck from Longmont, uh, welcome, welcome to the board. We also have a new alternate, uh, Director Deborah Mulvey from Castle Pines. So with that, uh, we will go to the um, to the next section of the agenda, the action items. Item four, 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program Amendment. Mr. Cottrell, please. There we go. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have one amendment um, to the 2023 Transportation Improvement Program this morning, and that is Central 70, uh, the project that is sponsored by CDOT. There are, there are three components to this amendment. Um, the first being a change to the prior funding. So the state bonds and loans will be decreased by approximately $46.7 million to account for transaction and interest cost reductions. The second component is the amendment will add $30.3 million in state faster bridge enterprise funds to FY22. And this is to reflect a previous resolution from CDOT allocating cons construction contingency. The third component um, will add federal and local funding to both FY21 and 22 to reflect the developer's proposed refinancing of their TIFIA loan. They're refinancing the TIFIA loan to increase the eligible costs and lower interest rates. The additional funds will mainly be used for design and construction of the UPRR crossing and the cover. The state funding sources remain unchanged with the developer's refinancing plan. Uh, so that is the single amendment that we have uh, for you this morning. I'll be happy to take any questions or comments, or certainly anyone on the line from um, CDOT could also help with those. Uh, if not, the proposed motion before you is to recommend to the board the proposed amendment to the 2023 TIP. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Uh, committee members, are there any questions or comments at this point in time? Please raise your virtual hand or press star six on your phone. Not seeing any hands raised, I will uh, entertain a motion if, if any committee member pleases. Chairman second, Doug Tisdale. Um, um, uh, did, 
did we get a first uh, director tisdale i my apologies i i did not uh, offer a motion i'm willing to entertain a motion oh i consider that a motion then i thought i heard one in the background there but i probably misheard that is my motion to director recommend Tisdale. dr cog board of directors the attached amendment director tisdale thank you very much uh, do we have a second on the line This is Jeff Dolman, so moved. Thank you, Director Dolman. Um, we have a motion and a second. Um, with with that, we will. I will ask uh, for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against. Abstain. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item: uh, Fiscal Year 2020 Transportation Improvement Program project delay actions. Mr. Cottrell, please. Thank you again. So the adopted TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, including how to address delays if they happen. These delays, and regardless of, of what the reasons are, do tie up the limited funds available for Dr. Cog to allocate. So after the end of federal fiscal year 20 in October, uh, Dr. Cog requested CDOT and RTD to both review the status of those projects that had FY20 funding, in addition to those projects that were delayed for a first year last year, first time last year. So, and after verification, uh, Dr. Cog's staff contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were ni not initiated and therefore delayed to find out the reasons for the delays and to also assist them to develop a plan to initiate those project phases that were delayed. So the attached report summarizes those project phases that were delayed as of September 30th. So COVID-19 obviously this year, you know, played a role in the development of these projects, even if a project was not delayed. Over the last few months, um, TIP project sponsors were allowed to make a request for Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog staff to consider the COVID-19 impacts to their project delays. These options included uh, one, to move the delay deadline out or essentially reset that, uh, that date to a future time. Um, second, move funding into a different year. So this would be an example of move FY20 funding to FY21 or to shift their entire three or four year program out one year. Um, or the third option would be to apply to CDOT to use uh, state toll credit. The staff recommendations regarding the COVID-19 impacts to the delayed projects are included within the report. So overall, the report states that seven projects were delayed for a second year, uh, with two projects already having initiated their phases. At the November Dr. Cog board meeting, each project asked for a variance and TIP policy to continue. The remaining five delayed projects were granted a 120-day extension. In addition, uh, four of the projects also requested and were granted some sort of delay extension due to COVID-19. And again, those are summarized within the report. In addition to these projects that were delayed for a second year, uh, 32 projects were first year delayed in which five have already been initiated and therefore are no longer delayed. So a motion um, to approve staff's recommendations this morning would allow them to continue. So just a few observations about these delays. Um, the number of delayed projects, uh, it is approximately double versus any typical normal year. Although it's important to point out that the first year of any four year tip cycle typically does have a higher number of delays versus the other three years. And this is mainly due to project sponsors um, working through the initial process to begin their IGAs. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 impacted most of these 32 uh, first-year delayed projects, obviously some more than others. Approximately half stated that COVID-19 was the main or sole reason for their delay. And I think it's safe to say that almost all of, the, all of the TIP projects were impacted by COVID in some way, even if they weren't delayed and showing up in this report. Um, approximately 40% of the delays were attributed to either IGA development or execution. Um, and it's obviously higher than normal, um, especially since sponsors have had since August of 2019 to execute August, August of 19 being when the TIP was adopted. Um, from observations by staff, um, these delays are coming from both the local sponsor 
and CDOT and or RTD. Uh, and finally, project staffing and project pre-planning or the work that would go into a project pre-application continues to occupy some of the reasons for these project delays. Um, however, I think it's important to point out that most of these, again, are, are due to COVID, even though there are still some lingering issues. So at this time, be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Um, if not, the motion before you would be to recommend to the board actions proposed by Dr. Cox staff regarding the TIP project delays for uh, federal fiscal year 20. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Uh, committee members, if there are any questions for Mr. Cottrell uh, on this item, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six so we can put you in the queue. Um, after review of the list, I am seeing uh, no hands raised. With that, I am willing to entertain a motion. With the line being open, um, please feel free to um, speak out. Music, so moved. Thank you, Director Music. So moved. Thank you, Director Malpietti. I appreciate it. With a motion and a second, uh, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item, item six, fixing America's Surface Transportation Act 2022 infrastructure condition and 2021 public transportation agency safety plan targets. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, please. Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will be discussing two of our federal performance measure areas that we have upcoming deadlines on. So under the FAST Act, which is our current federal legislation, state DOTs, transit agencies, and metropolitan planning organizations are required to set performance targets for the five particular areas that you see on your screen. The one we're most familiar with is our safety targets that we bring before y'all annually, but this morning we'll be discussing our infrastructure condition targets, which we set back in 2018, and a new requirement from the federal transit side, public transportation agency safety plan targets, uh, or PTASP for short. As these are the federal targets, uh, most of the process is prescribed either through the final rule or in subsequent federal guidance. So in many cases, we are not just instructed on what performance measures to be looking at, we're also instructed to be looking at particular data, look at particular timeframes, and what those calculations are to set those targets. In all cases, uh, state DOTs, transit agencies, and MPOs are encouraged to use the best available data on hand. And while these are intended to be achievable targets, they are also intended to be realistic and are very near term. The first one we'll look at are our infrastructure condition targets. Uh, within this, we'll be looking specifically at our pavement condition targets. Now, there are four performance measures that cover pavement condition. It's the percent of interstate pavements and non-interstate national highway system pavements that are in good condition and in poor condition. A segment of pavement is considered good or poor if you look at the four condition rating areas that you see on the bottom of your screen. If a segment of pavement is rated poor in two or more of those using the federal methodology, then it's considered a pavement in poor condition. There is a minimum standard uh, for the interstate system to not exceed 5% of the interstate system in poor condition. Otherwise, the state loses some of their flexibility in a portion of their federal funds. Now, these two-year and four-year targets were set back in 2018. CDOT worked with Dr. Cog and all the MPOs in the state to set these statewide targets. And then Dr. Cog, as the MPO, was only required to set a four-year target, and we elected to support CDOT's four-year target. Now, CDOT had the option at the mid-performance period, which we are right now, to revise their four-year target, and they've elected to do so. The Transportation Commission took action back in September to adopt the revised four-year targets that you see on the screen to the far right. This was based on improved data collection that they were able to do over the past two years, uh, and the new targets are a reflection of the current performance of the system. Now, because Dr. Cog elected to support the state's targets back in 2018, we now have the option of either continuing to support the state's targets or setting our own for the remaining two years uh, in the middle of the performance period. 
Within your meeting packet, there's also additional information from CDOT regarding this topic, if anyone would like more information. And then I will pause here for any questions that might have come up for pavement condition, but it will be staff's recommendation at the end of the presentation to continue to support the state's targets. Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. Committee members, any, any questions at this time? Please uh, raise your virtual hand and we will call upon you or press star six and we'll put you in the queue. Uh, I, am, I am seeing um, no questions at this time. Please feel free to continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So our second hey, area sorry. will be... Oh, no, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Director Shaw. Sorry, uh, I had raised my hand and and uh, I guess you didn't see it, but I wanted to make a point here if I could. Yes. Um, if I tend to support staff's recommendations, but if CDOT could use some help at the state legislature, because invariably this must relate back to funding, um, you know, it, uh, I don't know if Dr. Cog can lend that hand, but I hope that we can. This is this is um, this was very sad to see these changes and the direction that we are headed. Personally, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Director Shaw. Any anybody else for questions or comments at this time? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Cam Kennedy. Uh, I'm back and I see a hand raised from Angie Riviera uh, Malpetti. So uh, Angie, when you're ready, please go ahead. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I just put it down. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I don't see any hands raised at this time now, Mr. Chair. All right. I appreciate that. Um, Please, please continue with the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So our second area will be the FTA's Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan targets, again, PTASP for short. Now, um, these were required for all operators of public transportation systems that are recipients of FTA grant funds. So in our region, that's obviously the Regional Transportation District. Uh, in addition to setting the targets you see on your screen, RTD is also instructed to s develop, adopt, and certify annually a Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, in addition to the PTASP targets. Uh, their board took action earlier this year on both of those items as well. So they have adopted a 2021 PTASP and 2021 PTASP targets. Similar to the federal highway side of performance measures, MPOs also have the option of either supporting the transit agency's targets or adopting their own for the region. Uh, these targets are also included in the meeting packet and there's additional information from RTD in the form of a presentation as well for those who would like more information. Uh, in addition to setting targets related to safety across their transportation system, you'll also see there are targets for reductions in employee injuries and on-the-job injuries. So there are safety targets for the agency in particular too. Uh, because RTD has set their 2021 targets and they've uh, taken the effort to develop the 2021 PTASP, it's Again, staff's recommendation that we support the transit agency targets as they are the primary regional transportation provider for the region. There are still a couple more slides, but I'll pause here if there are any questions for this topic. We also have a staff member from RTD on hand if there are any questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, if there's any, um, if there are any hands raised or uh, anybody presses star six on their phone, please feel free to call upon them for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do see a hand raised from Don uh, Stanton. Don, when you're ready, please go ahead. My hand is down. Oh, okay, thank you. I do not see any hands raised now at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. Please continue with the presentation. We did want to provide a high-level summary of the actions that Dr. Cog has taken in the past and the actions we anticipate to take in the future related to our federal performance measures. Like I mentioned, the one we're most familiar with are our safety targets that we set annually, as you can see on the screen. Uh, 2018 was a big year for MPOs, uh, not just Dr. Cog across the nation, as they set their first round of targets. Uh, we anticipate 2022 being another big year for the targets you see on your screen. We'll be working with CDOT and RTD to set new 
two-year, four-year statewide or MPO targets for the particular areas you see. And with that, our requested motion is to move to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board the CDOT revised 2022 infrastructure condition pavement targets and RTD's 2021 PTASP targets as required by the FAST Act. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, committee members, if there are any uh, additional questions or comments, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six. Otherwise, I am willing to entertain a motion. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Chairman Doug Tisdale, I so move. Thank you, Director Tisdale. We have a motion. Is there anybody Second, Rivera Malpietti. Thank you, Director Rivera Malpietti. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Aye. Abstain? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item, item seven, uh, Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Program, Safer Main Streets Project Awards. Mr. Papstorf, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Um, CDOT's gonna run through a presentation. Um, Jan, I've given you um, presentation, uh, made you the presenter. Um, so you should be able to start that. Um, I think that, um, I just, I, before I hand off to Paul Josaitis to kind of introduce the topic, I do just want to say um, that we're pleased to finally bring this action forward to the RTC uh, for consideration. Uh, there was a unanimous recommendation from uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee last week. This is this is an important partnership and an, apart, uh, an important um, program. Uh, between Dr. Cog and CDOT to really make meaningful investments in multimodal safety improvements in the Denver region. Um, we've got, so as you'll see in the presentation, we've got some continued work ahead of us, but um, this is a, a really important first step. And so with that, I'd hand it off to Paul Josaitis, the CDOT Region 1 uh, Director. Ah, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I was I was muted. Um, Paul Josaitis, Region 1 Director. Uh, today, we're going to give you an update on the status of the Safer Main Streets program. Before I start, I just want to thank you in advance for your participation in this process. Our goal is to get approval today, as Ron said, uh, to go forward with the program through the RTC, followed by the Dr. Cog Board and get these projects on the street as soon as we possibly can, which will also help stimulate the economy. This is an incredibly important program. We've all been talking about Vision Zero. We're all vulnerable, vulnerable users at some point, and the number of serious injuries and fatalities on our system are unacceptable. If we're serious about Vision Zero, we need programs like this, and we need to make sure projects selected through this program move the needle on safety. We did learn a lot while going through this process, and we want to include these lessons learned in any future grant opportunities. So our process to date included a project selection panel, then that was reviewed by the advisory panel, after which we brought forward the list to CDOT leadership, who felt that it would also be important to add some stronger analytic calculations to ensure that the best projects were selected. To that end, we asked our traffic and safety team to drop everything they were doing and do a full benefit cost analysis and level of service of safety analysis, which was a large undertaking, but brought some real numbers to the table. The good news was that in most cases, the BC and loss calculations solidified that we had actually selected the right projects. So to that end, we ended up selecting 30 projects totaling about $59 million, which is the list in your packet materials. Um, uh, Jan, can you move to the next slide? All right, I'm not going to run through this big list here, but here's a list of the program goals that we had for this um, grant grant solicitation. And then, um, Jan, can you go forward again? And then, I'm um, not going to run through this large list either, but here's the eligible project types that the um, various panels looked at. And then now I'd like to hand this off to Jordan Rudel to discuss the schedule and some other things. Thank you.
Good morning. Next slide, please, Jan. Hi. Um, as Paul was mentioning, we, we wanted to share kind of a visual here of, of the timeline and important milestones we've had relative to this call. We, uh, we put this call out. It was released on July 9th um, with Dr. Cog as well. <clears throat> and um, this here just highlights some of the steps that, uh, that Paul mentioned here briefly uh, a minute ago with our selection panel, um, the timelines meeting with advisory committee, um, getting their input on scoring, <clears throat> bringing that information back and um, and essentially gets us to where we where we are today, which is a huge milestone and important um, marker for us to accomplish. Um, I just want to mention um, here we we have a meeting today with with you all at RTC and then we have um, presentation as well tomorrow with board. And <clears throat> although um, Although the Transportation Commission won't be, you know, formally approving the list of projects, we will be bringing this forward to our, our CDOT Transportation Commission for a briefing and, um, and updates as well this month. So thank you, Jan. Next slide, please. Here, I just really want to capture some of the highlights. This is the exciting part of, of what we were able to accomplish and put out. We had 46 applications that we received in this program and a request for just over $122 million um, is, is what we received. And as you'll see here, just uh, explaining some of the data in front of us, half of those applications and requests um, were um, on state highways. And, and over half of those applications that we received of the 46 had some nexus or component um, relative to transit. And so knowing here that the Dr. Cog area covers both regions one and four, we wanted to provide just a little bit more of a breakdown of, of what, what the teams reviewed and, and what the applications provided. So you can see the breakdown here, looking at region one, uh, projects proposed within region one, um, amounts within region four, and um, and then you know there's there's a match component to this. So all of the all of the requested funding for this program equates to uh, essentially potential large dollar amount opportunity to move the needle on safety. Next slide, please, Jan. <clears throat> Here, um, just wanted to show visually. Um, uh, everyone's kind of aware of probably you know, the jurisdictions that you were part of and aware of for submitting, but I thought it was important here to show of the 46 applications. This is a, a summary and an overview within each jurisdiction of, of how many applications were processed. And, uh, and th this is a great, great spread across the, the Dr. Cog area here. Next slide, please, Jan. Um, <clears throat> building up here to, I, I guess, the more uh, exciting moment, um, you know, where we've landed overall is we have about 30 projects um, covering uh, 19 jurisdictions um, that, that are going to be recommended here for funding in, in this round. And we have, uh, I guess what that equates to is 16 projects for the moment that, that are not being recommended today, but um, further, you know, kind of assessing within the 30 projects that are being recommended. Uh, you see this, the, the needle's really moving here on, on the number of <clears throat> projects that are um, near existing transit, 83%. That's, that's strong and that's exciting and that's what we were hoping to see. And 65% of those 30 applications that we're recommending have, um, have uh, they're along our state highways. So as Paul mentioned, that 58, just over 58 million equates with match to right now an $83 million program. And um, we have a lot of excitement and uh, I, know, I know everyone else does here too to, to talk about these. And I think um, I'm gonna turn things over here to Jessica just to, to highlight what those 30 projects uh, equate to. Jessica Micklebust is our Deputy Director of Program Delivery. Thanks. All right, I just, can someone confirm that they can hear me, please? We can. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so what you have on the screen before you is the list of 30 projects that are recommended. I realize this might be really small font for some. This is also in your uh, packet, I believe on page 86. Um, so what we've got here are really projects that are um, really going to push us forward in effectiveness for safety and multimodal across um, the Denver metro area in both in Region 1 and Region 4. 
And I can say as a panel member reviewing all 46 of the applications, we spent many hours of deliberation, really taking time to look through many different lenses at these projects. We looked at them both from um, a benefit cost ratio, but also in, in all of the other selection criteria that we were considering, including expanding access for all residents, um, innovation, proximity to um, schools and other amenities that our residents are trying to get to. So we really took um, a rigorous and hard look at the applications and really are proud of the list that we came forward with that you see before you. Uh, we took um, you know, a look at existing conditions, what's out there around these projects today, what are we seeing currently? We also took a look at future conditions. What are we anticipating in the future if this project isn't built or isn't constructed? Um, so I'm gonna talk through a few of the projects that were awarded just to kind of give you a feel for the portfolio of the projects that are recommended for funding. Um, one of our biggest awards is the Lakewood Project, the West Colfax Pedestrian Safety and Infrastructure Project, uh, recommended for award at $10 million. This project has had 806 crashes in the last five years, 93 of those bike and pedestrian collisions, including many fatalities. Um, this project had a larger benefit cost of 2.91. So if you've ever driven this stretch um, of Colfax, you're aware it's, it's very hard to navigate as a pedestrian or a bicyclist. So this was kind of one of our um, you know, highest award projects. We really felt like it, it hit the bullseye on what we were looking for with this program. Um, another project that's a little bit different. So in Commerce City, we had a Colorado Boulevard bike and pedestrian improvements from 68th to 70th. Um, this is near the new end line for the light rail, the 72nd station. So this one does not currently have a benefit cost. It was currently zero. And those projects still received equal consideration because as I said, we were looking into the future. So what are we seeing here in the upcoming you know, months or years? And really we're seeing a light rail station with no sidewalk um, access to that station. So this project was recommended for award because we really felt like it was going to um, provide excellent accommodation to a transit amenity. Another project in Region 4 in Nederland, um, some crosswalk improvements. Again, a little bit lower on the BC scale, which was okay because we looked with this one kind of more of the lens at are we, are we providing an expanding access for all residents and making communities um, walkable and livable. So this project is near an affordable housing unit and really will provide some excellent amenities for those residents that live in that area and really was starting to shift our ability to, sh to move access. Um, another project finally that I'll highlight is one that we did a partial award. So on our list you'll see um, a requested amount column as well as an award amount column Several uh, municipalities received partial award for their projects. Um, one example of that is the Boulder project along 30th Street, um, separated bike lanes along State Highway 7, Arapahoe Avenue. Um, and so that one was a partial award. And what we noticed with that one, again, was it had a little bit of a lower BC, but if we look at the context of that community, Boulder is a very avid biking community. You've got a lot of biker um, bicyclists that are commuting to and from work and to and from school. This project is very near to um, the home of the Colorado Bucks. So um, kind of taking the lens on this one of, you know, it's a really great project. And although um, a little bit lower crash history, still a high value. And so we decided to par um, award or recommend award for a partial of this project. And they did indicate um, in their application, as did other municipalities, that their project was scalable in size. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, talk through a little bit, a few of the projects, you know, as a panel member, we spent hours really looking through these and understanding um, how these projects would um, enhance the communities that they're located within. So um, as you look through the list, um, you're welcome to, you know, kind of digest where they're located. And on top of that, I'm gonna move to the next slide, Jan. All right, so one of the tools that we had as the panel, um, and Jan has just clicked on the link, which is also available in your packet, 
Um, this is a mapping tool that really allowed us to kind of take a look at the geographic proximity of these projects. Um, how are we spreading out the funds to really kind of um, deliver some great amenities, um, both in region one and region four. So the green dots are those projects that were selected and green lines are some of the locations of the projects selected. The bluer lines are showing you um, the high injury network and the critical corridors. It was an important part of this program to be located you know, near or, or on one of those corridors. And so we wanted to take, uh, make sure that we were delivering projects that touched as many of those corridors as we possibly could. Well, this is been... Hi, Tina. Is there a question, Tina? Okay. Um, so the map, the map is available for your use if you'd like to go in there. And as Jan was scrolling over, he could, you could see it pulls up the details of each of those projects. So just a different way to kind of look at and analyze the data that we had. Next slide. All right, what happens next? Where are we in our process? Um, as Paul mentioned, we have learned a lot of lessons um, about a project, you know, a grant program of this size. And so as part of that, we've, we've been a little bit um, nimble in how we've been able to kind of adjust for our next steps. Um, obviously today we're at the RTC meeting and then this list will move forward for recommendation. Um, by the Dr. Cog board in December. And then we do have some remaining funds, approximately, I think it's 19 to 20 million. We're awarding or recommending award for 58 million. So what we've got, um, what we've developed is a project solicitation 1.5. And really what this is, um, is an opportunity for those agencies who've already applied for safer main streets to repackage and work with CDOT and Dr. Cog and the panel to repackage and resubmit um, for those projects that were not originally selected. So this is not an open call for brand new projects. This is really working with those agencies um, that were not awarded or received partial award on their projects um, to meet with us and talk through, you know, some of the applications, it's hard to convey um, information or maybe they were lacking some information or the story which just wasn't quite clear. So this 1.5 solicitation is an opportunity to clarify or provide additional data um, for consideration. So that will be happening um, probably in January. We've already blocked out some time for individual meetings with applicants who would like to repackage and resubmit. Um, and I think that's the second or third week of January, and you'll be getting um, some notices soon about that. Um, we will be sending out letters, for, so everyone who applied will get one of several types of letters. Um, there is a full award letter, there's a partial award letter, um, there's a regret letter, and there's also um, some agencies that submitted multiple projects might have a combination of one of those letters, so you may have a full award letter with um, a regret that encourages you to consider resubmitting for um, solicitation 1.5. We also have heard loud and clear that we've had some bumps in our IGA process and that we could really use some streamlining and efficiency efforts in that space. So we are working internally at CDOT to see what we can do to make sure, um, as Paul mentioned, we wanna get these projects out on the street as fast as possible. So we, we really wanna try and avoid delays with our internal um, IGA and contracting process. So we've heard you and we're working on some great measures to improve that. And with that, I believe we will open it up for questions. I've also got, so Paul and myself and Jordan, and I believe Rebecca White, um, director, um, is on the phone as well. So we will take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, if there are any questions or comments on this item, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six on the, on the phone to get you in the queue. Mr. Kennedy, I will turn it over to you for the questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first hand raised I see is from Ashley Stolzman. Uh, Ms. Stolzman, when you're ready, uh, please state your organization and go ahead. Hey, everybody. Ashley Stolzman. I'm the mayor of Louisville, vice chair of Dr. Cog. <clears throat> Thank you um, for the presentation this morning. But, um, I, I just I, There's a bit of a non sequitur, so I have a few questions. Um, 
you know, when Paul started in the presentation, he was talking about the importance of getting these on the street, and I couldn't agree more. I was really excited to hear that. Uh, I think the board approved this program back in March, so, you know, law in the making, and we're all eager to get these out because we actually reallocated funding that was for projects in a waiting list that had already been approved and were ready to go. So the sooner we can get these out, the better, um, and I'm really supportive of Paul's comment there. Um, but when I looked at that part, I don't know if you can put it back up, that had all of the projects listed on it in really small font, it looked like there were only about $60 million worth of projects funded even though we had about $80 million for the program. And, you know, there were, I think that the staff report said there were close to 2 million projects submitted. So I don't really understand why we don't just fund the project. Uh, so like if we just funded the projects that were approved, we would get up to, you know, 72 million and we could get these things going. Unless the idea was to get more projects funded, and then I don't understand why we didn't just fund some of the projects that were on the unfunded list um, that got really high scores. Somebody yeah, um, yeah, thank you for the question and comment. Um, so you're correct. Uh, only about, you know, 58, almost $59 million was awarded. We have $77 million that we're working with. Um, so the plan with this uh, 1.5 is we're not asking people to resubmit projects. What we're what what we're really asking is if your project was not selected, we'd like to come chat with uh, your agency and um, just learn more about the project and um, take all of that interest back. And really, um, we're not going to have enough money to award all the projects. I forget exactly what the number was. I think it was 122 million. So obviously, 77 million doesn't get us all the projects. But we do want to go back, um, make sure we're really selecting the best projects that do the best job of um, answering the questions in the grant application with a focus on safety, of course. And, um, and so to that end, um, I would ask uh, anybody on the call, any of the agencies, please reach out to us. We mentioned this at the TAC too. We're already setting up meetings with people to go through and chat about all of these projects. And then, like I say, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take all that information back and we'll figure out how to round out the rest of the program. Thank you, Paul. That, that's really helpful. So we'll be seeing those updates at the January RTC meeting then? Uh, you know, our goal is still to roll this out as quickly as possible. Um, right now, the, the primary goal is to get the 30 projects on the street that uh, we're asking for approval today. Um, there's, that means 30 intergovernmental agree agreements that we actually have to write. Our uh, contracts people are nervous about that. So we're going to focus on those projects. But over the next month, we'll be meeting with every local agency and coming back. Um, I'd like to think we could get to the January meeting, um, but that doesn't give us a whole lot of time. But I would say by February for sure. Um, so, I mean, that's, I guess, a little disappointing that it won't be till February to restore this. And I guess in the future, you know, I, I recognize you identified there were bumps. I think you, you mentioned that in the presentation, but I would just encourage people to do the reaching out. If there's questions or confusion about the projects, it just seems like this is an administrative delay to get these things rolled out. And we really need to get the money um, into projects to address the safety issues, you know, to save lives, to stimulate the economy, all the goals of the program. Um, and all those goals are really not furthered by just delaying the process. And, you know, it looks like they were scored. It looks like we have really good projects. So I guess I, I am left a little disappointed that we won't be seeing this until February. Um, but I, I guess I understand to some extent what you're saying um, and I'm hopeful that in the future we can improve on this. Yeah, thank you for the comment. We'll, we'll do our best to see what we can do, but with uh, the holiday in the middle, that's always a little rough. Uh, let's let's see where this takes us. Like I say to everybody in the call, please reach out to us as soon as possible, and we'll get these meetings um, set up and uh, and meet with y'all. Mr. Kennedy, are there any other hands raised at this time? 
No, Mr. Chair, I do not see any additional hands raised at this time. Uh, all right. So the uh, chair just has a as a as a comment. I mean, you know, I I, I sort of concur with uh, Director or Vice Chair Stoltzman. Um, you know, I, I think we have a good group of projects. Hopefully, uh, we can get the information the uh, the CDOT committee needs to uh, to further crystallize uh, what are good projects, so we can uh, we can support their their proposal or their application with a successful funding letter in the future. Uh, I also like to uh, to take a look at at the list of projects, and again, um, I trust our process. Our process um, here at Dr. Cog, we have worked on for a number of years, but I I like to see more of the non-traditional names, such as Erie Superior and Morrison, um, entering the uh, the process. It's it's always good to uh, to see that we're also taking care of um, other again more non-traditional communities. Um, you always set, sort of see the typical names out there, but you know Erie, Superior, and Morrison are are three names I I rarely see on on funding lists. So um, thank you again for that. Um, with no other questions, I am willing to entertain a motion. If there is a motion, please feel free to uh, raise your virtual hand. Press star six. Mr. Kennedy. So so moved, Director Williams. All right. Thank you, Director Williams. We have a second. I second. Uh, is, it, is that Director Stanton? It is. Don Stanton, second. Thank you very much, Director Stanton. With a motion and a second, I will call for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next part of our uh, agenda is the informational items. Uh, item eight, uh, fiscal year 2020 annual listing of federally obligated projects. Um, feel free to um, uh, peruse that. Uh, item nine, 2021 RTC meeting schedule. Uh, for those of you who have some time during this holiday season to populate your calendar with your uh, with next year's meeting, uh, please feel free to use this to uh, to do so. Um, the next uh, item, uh, next section is administrative items. Uh, item 10, member comments or other matters. If any other committee member has a, a question or a comment or other matters to address, please feel free to raise your virtual hand or press star six at this time. Mr. Kennedy, please let me know if you see anyone with a hand raised. I don't see any uh, hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with no other matters before this committee, uh, the next meeting is February 16th, 2021. And at 9.20 a.m., we will adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy New Year.